Hi, everyone. Oh my gosh, it's so great to see people's faces. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Good. Okay, awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for tuning in to our very first virtual studio visit here at Halcyon. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Nicole Dowd. I am Halcyon's Director of Programs. Um, and before we dive in, I know there are some folks joining us who are new to Halcyon, so I just want to briefly tell you about who our Halcyon Fellows are since um, our speaker today was a Halcyon Arts Lab Fellow in our very first cohort. Um, Halcyon is a nonprofit based here in Washington, D.C. and dedicated to empowering social entrepreneurs and civic-minded artists with extraordinary world-changing ideas, which um, in, during this time we are absolutely needed. The biggest way that we do this is through our fellowship programs. We provide a combination of housing, work and studio space, exhibition opportunities, stipends, and other resources. And if all of this sounds good to you and to anyone that you might know out there, I should mention that applications are currently now open for um, incoming cohorts starting in September of this year. And so those applications actually close this coming Wednesday. So we will drop a link in the chat if you are interested in learning more. Um, and if you're not sure where the chat is, it's just one of a uh, couple things that I want to point out here on Zoom since we're really all still getting used to this new virtual world that we live in. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a row of icons and one of which says chat. Um, this is where you can send us messages um, during the event. And along that bottom row, you can also find stuff like how to turn on and off your video. If you run into any problems with Zoom, just post in the chat and a Halcyon team member will respond to you. Um, you'll probably also notice that your microphones are automatically muted, and this is so that we get to hear Mercedes in the best way possible. So with that housekeeping out of the way, I uh, am really pleased to introduce Mercedes. Mercedes is a DC-based Argentinian American artist. She melts down weapons confiscated by the DC police and turns them into musical instruments, installations, and public works of art. She has also been excavating archives of missing invisible histories throughout her practice. She's currently, or she's been funded in the past by Open Society Foundation and Lightworks. She has exhibited, performed, and lectured at the Bronx Museum, the Kennedy Center, the Queens Museum, and the Smithsonian, just to name a few. She's been regularly hosting public gun destruction and melting ceremonies throughout the city as part of violence de-escalation programs. And she was a member of the very first Halcyon Arts Lab Fellows cohort. Shout out to all the Halcyon, Halcyon fellows and alumni who are tuning in right now. Um, and I've been so thrilled to witness her practice and work evolved as she has planted roots here in DC after the fellowship. Um, and once we can all go outside again, I encourage you to come to visit her studio in person at the Arts Lab. And so with all of that, I turn it over to Mercedes. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Yes. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so um, I'm so I'm so grateful to be here. Uh, Nicole, that was a very good introduction. Um, I'm super grateful to Halcyon. I think that, uh, you know, it's a it's a very strange um, career path to choose to be an artist, especially a unconventional artist, which I believe all Halcyon fellows are. And, um, you know, artists really need, artists and activists and cultural producers really need people in their corner who are willing to uplift them. Um, and I can say without certain that if I hadn't been a Halcyon Fellow, I think it would have taken me a lot longer to be a full-time artist. So I'm super grateful to Halcyon. And, um, and also in addition, I'm super grateful um, to have the space to give an artist talk uh, virtually because I think, you know, I think uh, given our current climate, we really need as much um, as, as much moments as we can to come together as artists or cultural producers and just have conversations and talk. Um, and I know that for, for me personally, that's kind of a, a difficult adjustment. Um, so before we begin, um, can everyone please close their eyes? I want everyone to close their eyes and to imagine that we're all collectively holding hands. I want everyone to slowly breathe in and then slowly breathe out. I want everyone to imagine that we're not inside of our apartments. We're not looking at computer screens. We're outside. 
We're standing in a circle. There's a kiln which is in front of us. Is it about 3000 degrees? I'm slowly passing each of you a bullet casing. The bullet casing is brass. It's a nine millimeter. It feels heavy in your hand. You feel its weight and you think about what it was used for. You think about how it went through forensic evidence in DC. You wonder if it was used in a crime, in a homicide, or found randomly on the street, how it was scanned for evidence. And as you look up to the blue sky and then back down to the kiln, you slowly take your hand and you drop the bullet casing into my red hot crucible. And for the next 15 minutes, you watch as the bullet melts down and is slowly cast into a bell. So can everyone please take another deep breath in and another deep breath out. Every single one of us have the possibility and the potential to be agents of change. If it's through your practice, if it's through your individual life, every single one of you have the capacity and the possibility to take an object which has been used for evil, an object which has been used to harm others and to take it and transform it into something which is positive, peaceful and caring. Can everyone please open their eyes? Yay, thank you. Okay. So, uh, like Nicole was saying, um, a big part of my practice is that I, uh, a big part of my practice is that I, under full screen. Uh, like Nicole was saying, a big part of my practice is um, I, I do take I take weapons which have been confiscated by the DC police. Uh, that's firearms, bullet casings, um, and after they go through forensic evidence, I melt them down and I transform them into musical installations and objects of care. Uh, and bullet bullet melting ceremonies have become um, really a cornerstone of my work. Uh, you know, I'm here in my apartment right now, and the church across my street has. Um, I've hosted a bullet melting ceremony there. Uh, I've, I've really been working in a lot of spaces which are kind of non-art spaces throughout the district. And uh, I think they're, they're, they're really important because uh, gun violence is such a big um, and overwhelming issue. And I think very often um, people feel like there's nothing that they can do um, in the face of it and in the larger scheme of it. Um, and so I hope I hope through these these ceremonies that I do that people can um, really feel like they be, can become agents of change and can uh, you know take take an object of hate and put it into their kiln and watch it be turned into something beautiful. Um, so that being so that being said, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some projects I've done in the past and um, and some points of inspiration and future projects I'm working on now. Um, so, uh, I was really making very different work uh, after I graduated from college and I was um, doing residencies throughout Latin America and uh, working as a sailor in New York. And, um, and then something happened which really transformed um, how, I've, how I viewed myself in the world and also how I viewed uh, my own practice. And that was the Orlando Pulse Club shooting. I'm gay, I'm Latina. I really, uh, I really felt like I easily could have been in that club. How many, how many gay Latina nightclubs have I been in my life? I don't even know. And, um, and I had always felt very unsafe in Latin America and very safe in the United States. And I think that uh, it was a really big wake up call. Um, and so that, that said, the first piece um, which I made in this body of work was uh, I took a six hour M6 rifle which is the exact model of rifle which was used during the shooting and I melted it down to make 49 movie bells and that's this piece right here. In honor of those who died from the Orlando Pulse Club massacre, I melted down a six hour M6 rifle, the exact rifle that was used during the tragedy and using that aluminum from the assault weapon, I made 49 Liberty Bells for each of the victims who died.
And this, this piece was um, really important to me for a couple of reasons. Uh, the Liberty Bell is not only a symbol of American freedom, but it's also a symbol which is used by the NRA to support Second Amendment rights. Um, and of course, in many cultures, when you ring bells, you're trying to resurrect uh, the dead. And um, in addition, this was also um, uh, how I developed my skills as a metalsmith. I went to a lot of um, blacksmiths and uh, foundries, and I said, this is what I want to do. Um, and you know, none of them really thought I should be doing that. Um, and so that was the first piece which I made. And it, I really, it took me a really long time to make because I, during, in making that piece, I uh, had to learn how to do all of these things, which I didn't know how to do beforehand. But I also think it was a, a blessing in disguise and um, you know, the beginning of, of my interest in, in working with metal and transforming objects of violence. Um, so I, my, my background is really in um, music. My, my mother was a professional dancer. Growing up, my entire family was very musical. And, um, and I think that I've always been very interested in trying to think about uh, art, not just as a single thing, but art as a complete experience of the body. And because my work so often references, um, uh, you know, bodies which have been taken away or harmed, I also believe it's very important for my work to always refer back to the body. And in the case of um, the Orlando piece, I felt that it was very important for the work to refer back to the queer body and the live queer body. Um, so this next piece is called The Last Song, and it is uh, through dance, song, and installations. It is trying to finish um, the last song, which should have but could not be finished during the Orlando Pulse Club shooting. Body, all of the dancing and falling. I slowly think that's right. And so throughout the course of the performance, um, very often my performances are very participatory. So as the performers rise, um, I also ask all of the performers uh, to, to really respond to the movement through an emotional reaction rather than through anything which is choreographed or pre-planned -pre beforehand. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's very important to me. So as the bodies rise and interact with the installations, which are cast out of weapons and melted guns and dedicated to those who lost their lives. Then the audience switches places with the performers and stand in the line of fire, which is the next piece that I'll talk about. And so over the course of the performance, rather than the queer bodies laying on the floor at the end of the performance, it is the audience which is laying on the floor at the end of the performance. And the queer bodies and the queer dancers and the queer singers become resurrected. Um, so I'm not going to play the whole thing because it's about two hours long, but um, it's on my website if anyone wants to see the full edition. Um, and I also performed it uh, in 2019 at the National Memphis, um where they have an anti-gun violence concert every single year. Uh, and the next piece I'm going to show is called The Line of Fire. And uh, this piece this is the first line of fire. And it, this one was made in 2018. And um, as an artist, I, who had made, first made a work in reaction to the line of fire, the shooting, um, I began to realize that uh, one of the problems behind gun violence is that um, not only that uh, 
you know, that this horrific thing happened and we all reacted, but gun violence is a structure, it's a system, it's something which can be expected. Orlando happened, but how many more queer people will die from gun violence? How many more people will die from gun violence in general? How many people will die because of um, the way that they identify, because of who they choose to love, because of how they look, because of what language they speak? All of this, um, I think that what's something that is so horrific is not only that it happens, but that it can be calculated, that we can calculate how many of these people will die on an annual basis, on a daily basis, and that there are expected numbers to come in the future. So the Line of Fire is um, it's an installation of bullet chimes. I'm going to make one for every year before I die. Uh, I've made three so far. And um, it's an installation of bullet chimes, um, which uh, normally range about 30 feet. And it has one bullet chime for every queer individual who's expected to lose their life from gun violence for the year to come. So this piece was, uh, is the 2018 line of fire. It was my first line of fire. And in that year, uh, 121 expected um, individuals who are queer were expected to lose their life in mass shootings. Um, and in that year, 120 individuals lost their lives to gun shoot to mass shootings. Um, and so, you know, for, for this piece, I think that it's important because as an artist, uh, you know, I don't think I should just be reacting to horrific acts of violence, but also thinking about how the problem is, is that it's structural and it's systematic. So the longer I live, the longer um, the, the line of fire will grow larger and larger. Right now I have three, which means combined the line of fire of all those pieces is 90 feet. And if, if I live for maybe another 40 or 50 years, then imagine how long that line of fire will be. Um, and uh, the piece crescendos, so it begins on the floor and then ends at the ceiling and in this way, it's sort of mimicking a graph which, um, which, which grows up and becomes uh, larger with time. Um, and uh, I, I wanted the bells to, to chime, they have a motor. Um, and I wanted that too, because it was reminding me of the ringing that you hear in your ears after you shoot a gun. So um, this piece is called uh, What a Second Can Do. Um, and I think sometimes as an artist, uh, you know, one of the things that I love about metal and transforming bullets is that anything is possible. You can, um, you can really make absolutely anything if you can imagine it and you can make a mold. Um, and so this is me, I'm melting down. Um, these are the types of bullet casings which are used in semi-automatics. They're a little bit uh, longer than what's used in a normal firearm. Um, and this piece is called uh, what a second can do, and that's because it is a harp which is cast out of 100 bullet casings, and the fastest gun in the world can shoot 100 bullets in one second. Um, and so this is me. Uh, the way that you make harp strings is that you cast an ingot, and then you have to anneal it, which means you heat it up and then you pound it. Um, and so the process of taking, the process of making uh, this very tiny Celtic harp and the strings for it out of bullet casing takes a really, really long time. Um, but I love the process because, again, I feel like it's, it's a, I couldn't think of a better way to try to transform bullets. Um, this is the final harp. And I also chose a harp because a harp is the, uh, it was one of the first instruments that was created and it was created to play to soldiers who were dying in the battlefield. And, um, this is pretty small, and I'm hoping one day to make uh, uh, a much a much bigger version of it, which would probably um, represent the different RPMs for different types of weapons. Um, and this piece is also really interesting because one of the women who helped me make uh, the piece actually, um, because it was so difficult technically, actually was uh, a member of, member of the NRA, which I didn't learn until after I had made the work and. Um, after asking her, you know, you know what my work is about, uh, why did you want to work with me? She said, I really believe that your work is about um, humanity and it's not about politics and how could I not um, be upset when people are dying unnecessarily, um, which, which I really loved. And um, as difficult as it may be sometimes, I'm really committed to trying to create bipartisan dialogue through, through my work and through my practice. Um, I'm also super surprised that I was even able to make that piece because it was uh, such a crazy idea. Um, 
So this is um, this is a part. This work is part of a, um, a new project which I'm doing, which is called um, "When Do You Feel Safe?" And it's called "When Do You Feel Safe?" because uh, it's it's called "When Do You Feel Safe?" because I wanted to really give um, students a a voice to articulate how they feel about school shootings. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm going to different schools and universities um, and teaching students how to take bullet casings and turn them into school bells. Um, and so I, every year I go to a new school and we cast a new bell and the size of that bell correlates to the, um, it correlates to the number of students who died from the school shooting. And um, in addition, I'm also creating an archive of student voices. So students are writing poetry and um, uh, articulating when they feel safe, if they do feel safe. Um, and uh, every time which I show the bells in a school as they tour around the country, um, I also, of course, want to work with the student choir. And, uh, and in the student choir, they're taking the poems which the students wrote and reinterpreting them into music. Um, Again, I think there's something powerful about the human voice. Uh, as a visual artist, I really feel like sometimes the voice can connect with you in a way that uh, I don't always immediately get with installation art or with visual art. And, um, and so this is uh, a group of students who I worked with at Montgomery College, where I was an artist in residence. The bells, which they're standing around, um, were all cast out of bullet casings. And they're the last 10, they represent the last 10 years of school shootings. And, um, and this is the song which they wrote, um, which is called Mercy. Please have mercy. So this is just such an amazing group. Um, and I think that, uh, so every time that the, the bells are displayed, um, I will uh, also play this music with the bells. And every new school that I work with, I also hope to work with the student choir so that this archive of singing student voices um, grows larger. But I mean, if, when I was in this performance, really I cried because there's something so powerful about students saying, please have mercy on me. Um, and they were also an incredible um, group. So um, this is a piece which um, is it's a commissioned piece from Antonius Bowie, who was also um, one of my fellows when I was an artist in residence at Halcyon. And uh, I love this work. You know, I think that um, when I was a student, I had like uh, I had a professor who obsessively paints the same ball for his entire life. And, um, and I think that I didn't realize it at the time, but I think that I definitely have that same obsessive quality in me, and um, which means that I'll probably be casting bells, uh, trying to perfect casting bells made out of guns and weapons um, for the rest of my life. Um, but, what, uh, but this is a slight variation on a bell, it's a gong. And, um, uh, and so this gong is, it's a Vietnamese gong and the piece is called One One Thousandth. And that's because it is cast out of 3,000 bullet casings um, and an estimated 3 million people died during the Vietnam War. So if this gong was actually the size um, that, that it should be, it would be a thousand times larger. Um, and uh, normally Antonius does a performance every year in front of the Vietnam Memorial. However, of course, this year um, they can't. And so I'm gonna be putting together video footage of the process of me making this, this gong and also interviewing Antonius's um, family members um, and their, their memories about the, 
the war, um, the Vietnam War, and putting those together as a way of creating a sort of um, digital memorial um, rather than a live memorial. And uh, the piece does the piece, and and stay tuned for that because um, the piece looks much prettier now that it's been cleaned up. Uh, but I love the process of casting, um, and of course, the the bigger you get when it turns to metal. I mean, we just poured this, and it's still on fire because it's so incredibly hot when you pull it out of its mold. Um, and uh, there's just something in, incredibly satisfying about casting bronze and brass and steel. Um, and I love the the aggression of of casting, um, and then turning it into something which is soft and and beautiful, um, and caring. Uh, and and I'm really happy that, that the gong worked, um, and it sounds very good. Uh, so stay tuned as that piece um, and the final video come together. Um, so this piece um, is actually in Memphis, Tennessee. It's a public art piece. It's suspended about 100 feet off of the ground and there's a huge um, swing underneath it so that as you swing underneath the, um, the piece, you become closer and closer to the bells and then farther and farther away, depending on where you're moving. And, um, you know, I think sometimes it's a little bit difficult. Um, I don't know how the other artists in the, in the, the crowd feel, but sometimes it's so hard to be an artist and to spend, uh, to go to a space, maybe spend like a month installing it and then you have to leave it. Um, you know, I think there's, um, sometimes I feel like I want to spend more work, more time with my pieces um, because, you know, you, you spend so long making them and installing them and then you have to, you have to leave them. Um, and that's definitely kind of how I feel about this piece. This piece is uh, near Aretha Franklin's house um, in Memphis, Tennessee. It's dedicated to Ray Lee. It's part of the upcoming film, um, which is produced by Adam and Spearman called Be What a Bullet Can't Be. And um, Rayleigh lost his life right um, beneath the piece. And uh, he lost his life when he was 23, which is why there's 23 bells cast out of melted bullets. And, um, and then the top portion of the piece is uh, the bells are hanging off of a spiralized um, rifle, which I welded together and then spiralized. And, um, and I worked with his family in creating this piece. Um, and so we engraved a poem um, on the bells. And, um, and the piece and the memorial was also really created um, because of his son. And that's why um, these bells, as you can tell, the ringers are actually tiny little bells. And those are cast out of the, the tip of a bullet. Normally I use the, the casing, which is the back end. So the tip is copper. It's actually much harder to get the metal out of that because you have to deconstruct a live bullet rather than one which has already been spent. And um, I really wanted um, to have these two bells, a little bell and a big bell, because to me it also really represented um, you know, a father-son relationship and also a son who had to grow up without his father because his father was randomly shot. Um, So um, I think it's very important to always dream as an artist. Uh, you know, I, um, I've been doing this long enough to know that things do eventually happen. And sometimes you have to make a small version of something before you make a big version. But um, I, I work a lot with the Department of Forensic Science. That's where all of the bullet casings and all of the weapons which I get go through. Uh, they are really sweet because they also love my work. Um, normally if someone uh, retires um, or has should receive like some type of award. They commissioned me to make a small piece cast out of melted bullets, which might be a plaque or something else. Um, but uh, this is one of the pieces which I would really love to make in DC um, and will eventually happen. Um, this is in the lobby of the Department of Forensic Science and um, the piece uh, would be one bell for every individual who's lost their lives to gun violence in DC since the building which was created, which is, uh, and it was created in 2012. And, um, and so at the moment, the piece is about 1,200 bells. But of course, the longer, the longer it takes to make the piece, the more, the more bells will be cast. And um, 
I, as part of my bullet melting ceremonies, I also work with a lot of violence prevention programs in DC. So what I would love to do is for the bells, which are um, suspended in, in this installation to be made through, um, through bullet melting ceremonies, but also through uh, these um, violence prevention programs I, I work with and work in where um, people are, are learning how to cast the bells themselves. So that um, for, for each bell, which is cast by, um, for each bell, which is made for an individual who lost their lives and has their name engraved on the bell. There's also um, someone uh, who, who has gone through one of my workshops who has also cast that bell. Um, and eventually I would really love for, uh, you know, these, these spirals of, these spiral installations of healing and of bells to be an ongoing process, which continue um, to sprout up every single year um, in the Department of Forensic Science, but also in, in DC. And, um, and just to give you guys an idea, uh, so I, I do work with uh, the DC police. I don't get all of their weapons. I only get a, a small section of their weapons, although I do get a lot of their bullet casings. Um, if I, the, the weapons which don't get passed on to me, um, some of them get restocked and resold. Um, uh, but since in the past, uh, in the past few years, DC has um, collected over 10,000 firearms, which is really, really high for uh, a, a city which is this size. Um, so this is the, the last piece I'm going to show you all. Um, I, a lot of, one of my favorite type of pieces to make is um, really personal pieces. And this is a woman, this um, is a woman I met actually uh, last year at a bullet melting ceremony I did as part of By the People at Hillier. And, um, and she came up to me at the end of the bullet melting ceremony and said, you know, I have these, uh, I have these bullets which almost killed my father during the Lebanese civil war and we don't know what to do with them. Um, you know, it, it represents a really uh, horrible thing, but also he almost lost his life and we would, we don't want to throw them away, but we'd like for you to transform them. Um, and so I transformed them into the two bullets into two cedar trees and, um, the Arabic here means, uh, together, um, which is next to the cedar trees and the cedar trees are cast of the lead from the bullet and, uh, the, the Arabic. Uh, circle is cast out of out of the remaining grass, which was around the, the bullet casing, and um, I think that there. I think that's the that jewelry is a very important part of my work, and that's because sometimes I make these um, massive pieces, which are in public space, but also gun violence is something which people have to walk around and deal with it on a daily basis, and it can be a very intimate and emotional and personal issue, and that's why I also love making jewelry because. I believe that, um, you know, jewelry is something that you can hold close to your heart and it can feel very intimate. Uh, and I think that's, that's really important. And um, I also love doing these commissions which tie into history. And the more that I do this, the more people come up to me and they're like, I have, you know, a rifle which was uh, used in World War II and belonged to my father. I'd like for you to turn it into an, into an object that will, that will remember him and be important to our family. So. The more that I do this, the more kind of um, interesting things and interesting opportunities I have to transform these also historical um, weapons as well. Um, so, so that being said, uh, I'm um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, how I'm trying to shift my practice uh, given the current restraints and the crisis that we're going through uh, with the coronavirus. Um, I think that, uh, first of all, it's, it's something which is incredibly difficult for me. I'm, um, not only, I know that for some people working from home is really hard because you, uh, you know, you have to work in your space, but I'm not even used to working on a computer all day. I'm used to like using an angle grinder in a studio and being incredibly loud. So I think it's, it's a difficult transition for me, but I also truly believe that as creatives and cultural producers, like now is a time to shift our practice and to adapt because um, the world is in crisis in many, many ways. And I think that it, it does not only have to do with the coronavirus. Um, gun and ammo sales are up 700% uh, in the past couple of weeks. In March alone, March, 
was had the highest number of gun sales ever in the United States. Um, and I think that uh, it's really difficult for the world and for the US because there is this big thing which is consuming our lives and consuming the news and maybe that means that people are not thinking about um, other things which are going on but just because we're in quarantine doesn't mean that um, then shootings have stopped or that gun violence has stopped. Um, it means that there is more ammunition, there are more guns in the home, um, uh, domestic violence has increased a lot, suicides have increased a lot, and it also means that when people have to uh, mourn the loss of their loved ones, they're sometimes mourning them in quarantine, which is really horrific. Um, so I've received a small grant from every town, and I'm going to be conducting a digital bullet melting ceremony um, for the El Paso community. I'm going to be casting a bell and also writing a manifesto of love because the, the shooter who attacked um, the individuals in, in Walmart, he had also written a manifesto called The Inconvenient Truth, which was a manifesto of xenophobia and of hate. Um, so to try to sort of take back that narrative and create something which is healing for the El Paso community. Um, so I'm going to start with that virtual bullet melting ceremony. And what I'm hoping to do is that every Friday, um, while we're all in quarantine, to do a virtual bullet melting ceremony every single Friday. Um, and I think that's uh, important for a couple of reasons. I think it's good to create structure. I know that I personally um, need some structure in my practice right now. Um, but also because uh, you know, there's so many people who are mourning the loss of loved ones. There are individuals in DC who recently uh, lost their children or loved ones to gun violence. Um, and if there's any way that, you know, my practice can help, even if it's only uh, a virtual experience, but still being able to send those individuals the final cast bell, um, then that's, that's really important to me. Um, uh, and I believe that that's, uh, you know, that's, you know, I think that the process is just as important as the final result, and I hope that the process can can still be effective, even if it's happening virtually. Um, and I'm also going to be releasing a collection of jewelry, and so for each piece of jewelry which is sold, it will be funding one virtual bullet melting ceremony. Um, Homie, I'm going to be having a virtual exhibition with Homie, who's also a Halcyon Fellow, um, and, and I'm actually wearing one of them right now. Um, so it's, it's, this is brass and then this is the, um, this is made out of a section of a rifle. Um, and I'm also going to be, um, creating a collection of jewelry because I now have to work in my apartment. And, um, I think that's pretty much one of the only things I can make because my practice as a metal artist is so messy and so loud. And hopefully I will only semi drive my girlfriend insane if I'm working on jewelry. Um, and then the other thing that I'm going to be doing, uh, during this crisis is I'm also going to be working with a couple of non-for-profits to create a digital campaign which is responding to people buying um, guns and ammunition. Um, and so what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be putting together uh, videos of my past of my past works and we're going to be asking people um, that to donate the amount of money that they would spend maybe on like a pack of ammo um, to an organization which is trying to help people during this time of need. Um, so in DC, that might be like Martha's Table, uh, and um, and to really try to uh, to speak directly to the people who are are buying um, guns and ammunition right now, um, which I which I think is really important. And I also think you know, as as an artist, I truly the more the more that I do this, the more that I realize that sometimes my role. Um, is really to create a form and a voice of visual representation. Uh, you know, so if there's a, a movie or a film or an organization which is called Bullets to Books, how can I um, visually articulate what are all of the goals, the activisms, the years and years and years of effort and everything that they want to communicate through a work of art, through a melting process where a community comes together and melts down bullet casings to cast, um, you know, a book which is very much the opposite of a bullet or of gun violence. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Um, look out for that as well. And I think that kind of wraps up my talk a little bit. Uh, for anyone who wants to see more, I'm going to take question and answers. For anyone who wants to see more examples of my work, my website is stephaniemercedes.com. 
um, for anyone who wants to buy or fund a, um, a bell to be, to be sent to someone, there's a link on there. And, um, you know, I really think that this is the, the time right now where we need to wrap our arms around our fellow artists, around our fellow members of the creative community. I think that um, not only are we all in a lot of financial distress, but it's also really difficult for us to completely transform the nature of our practices. Um, and I know that for me personally, like I, I work better if I'm surrounded by people. I've never had a studio by myself ever. Um, and so I think, you know, things like this uh, artist talk are just so important for um, our community to thrive. Um, and to and to continue um, during this time of crisis. Yeah, so that's it. Um, so I think we're going to do question and answers. If uh, okay, so I think I'm going to go to stop share. If everyone can go to um, at the bottom, there's an option. If you go to your participants at the bottom of your Zoom, or you can raise your hand and ask a question. Hopefully, I said that right. I'm also like the most technologically enough person probably on the planet. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. I think um, Ileana has a question, so we can we can go to her. Hi. Hi. How are you? How are you? Good. Thank you so much for doing this. I I I love your work, and I hope that I uh, I'm able to see it in person when this is all over. Yes. Um, yeah, and that um. Uh, I also work with uh, gun violence, um, and I, one of the questions that I had from people sometimes is that if, uh, if, if one day uh, there, there is enough gun laws and enough gun control, do you think you'll change what, what you're working on? Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of times, um, a lot of times when I sell a piece or whatever it is, I write like a, a contract um, because I want that person to understand that um, if you own my work or if you're working with me, that comes with a level of responsibility. You can't just like put my work in a closet and like forget about it, right? Because that is like also an object of activism. And normally my contracts, which I write, are void if, if, if gun violence isn't an issue anymore. Like if, if no more people die, then the contract, you know, becomes void. And I, I would love for, um, for me to have to stop making this work. I know, I know. I mean, I don't, not that I believe that it will stop anytime soon, especially like you say now, March is actually the month when more, more gun sales than ever. And, and now happening this is, is a little bit crazy. So, that it com somehow can be related. So I, the other question is, I'm having a little, a little bit of difficulty trying to push my agenda with everything that is happening because I think that it's already very difficult for people to just go to social media and, and, and find things and then keep pushing something as horrific as gun violence is. So what is your, your so, take on that. So what, one of the things that I would say, and actually I'm, um, I didn't mention this, but there is, uh, there is also another Halcyon fellow that does, um, her organization uh, basically allows people to directly contact the representatives on issues which they care about. And we are hoping to do a virtual mediated discussion um, with both people who have been affected by gun violence and by people who are gun owners, um, with mediation being my work. And I think that, I think that, to be honest, like, um, I, uh, I think sometimes, like, m my installations are uh, very emotional, and they're also very beautiful, and they're also really soft. So people experience the installation, they're like, oh my god, this is so beautiful, what is this about? And then they go into the installation, and they're like, oh, this is someone who lost their life. So I think that it's very different than someone who, a protester who you meet on the street, who's saying, like, no more guns. And then the person who is pro-gun says, oh my God, you're taking away my rights, you're taking away my guns, and then they freak out. So I think, I think, I think that, um, and I've always been surprised when people who have very different opinions than me like my work. But I think that that's kind of a really important part of my practice is because, and I think it's because it's this sort of like soft emotional space that they're entering into the conversation um, into. And then uh, in this way, it's kind of, and then, and then they're like, oh, maybe there should be more, you know, gun control. Um, 
And it's really difficult because yes, I would love to, you know, totally my goal is to like melt down every single gun in the world and turn it into a, a, like um, into bells. But also sometimes when I'm talking to people, I try to scale it back a little bit. And, you know, I've worked with on, I've melted down rifles that have like an RPM of like one per minute and they're really so ineffective. And it's like barely one per minute, you know, and they are truly works of art. Um, and so I think that there's a big difference between uh, you know, an AK-47 with a bump stock or even like a hand revolver versus like a really ancient like hunting rifle. And so what I say to people who have that difference of opinion is me is like, if you want to have your hunting rifle, that's fine, which is so, so, so slow. Like if that's your method of protection, I understand, but I don't understand all of the other things. Um, and I think, I think it's super important right now to try to create these spaces of dialogue where we can talk to people who have different um, different views. And that's one of the reasons that I want to create this campaign, because I don't want to just be making pieces, which is preaching to the choir and preaching to people who already have the same views as me. Because to be honest, as some sometimes my work is very much just for people who have um, experienced gun violence and for them to, um, to be able to heal, in, if only in a very small way. But I also would like to be able to reach people who have very different views on me. And it's, it's really hard. I know. Yeah. Thanks, Celia. Um, I want to take one question from the chat, and it's like on a couple different things. So there are a few people that want to know when um, the Healing Project for El Paso um, and on your virtual ceremonies will take place and where they can find them. Um, okay, so they're going to be on my Instagram live. And for everyone who's on my Instagram live right now, it will be filmed better than what I'm currently doing. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually really lucky. I think that the church across the street from me is going to let me do, um, bullet melting ceremonies because I can't do it in my apartment. Um, and Halcyon is shut down. Um, but they have like an outside space. So I'm going to reach out to them and I'm pretty sure that's a good idea. So, um, look out on my Instagram live. Um, I'm not totally sure when the El, El Paso bullet melting ceremony is going to happen. I think maybe, uh, maybe next week, but also maybe a little bit longer. I want to make sure that it's like coordinated um, really well um, and has enough time. But uh, I will definitely at the very least do a virtual bullet melting ceremony if it's not that one. Awesome. Uh, on Friday. And, and normally you'll be, you, could, you can normally find you in the parking lot at the arts lab, but I, we have some very serious circumstances that have been well, we very, so, so, um so I have just been like intensely casting before Halcyon got shut down um, so that I could do something in my apartment. And um, I was actually melting bullets in the Halcyon parking lot the other day. And these really adorable women were like crossing through the parking lot and they were like, this is so amazing. And they were the Halcyon neighbors. They own a dog grooming place. And, was, <laughs> and they were so excited. Yeah, well, hopefully you'll be able to get access to your studio once this is all, all over with. Um, you know, we're trying to protect some of the residents that are there and start limiting access, you know. This no, 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 I, I know. Cool. But um, so another question from Nicole on chat, and then we'll go to maybe Eugene and then Maribel, um, and then that should take us to one o'clock, is how did you gain traction in your field? Um, I actually think, uh, so before moving to DC, I would say, so I, I got the artist residency at Halcyon, very grateful for that. And then I fell in love with my girlfriend, which is the main reason I stayed in DC. Um, but I actually think before that, I was really jumping around a lot. Like half of my family lives in Argentina, half my family lives in the States. So I feel like I was constantly moving in between the United States and Latin America. Um, and also I really like to travel a lot. So I was doing like random artist residencies and doing residency hopping. And I think that one of the best things for my practice was just staying put. It was, and I also think that every artist like has a space or a community that works for them. And I really have felt um, really supported and uplifted by the DC, um, not even just art community, but the DC community in general. And I think that, um, uh, and what I've realized recently is that, you know, a lot of, a lot of the commissions that I do, a lot of the works that I do are not in art spaces. I work with a lot of faith-based spaces. I work with a lot of community centers. Um, and, uh, and, and in some ways, like, I feel like that's kind of more important and it's more accessible. So I think that the way that, um, my practice has been able to grow is just like staying put in one place and uh to be honest like a, a lot of my work is word of mouth i meet someone and then they meet someone else or they hear about me 
um, and then we connect and um, and just for me it's staying put and staying dedicated to one topic and trying to really really understand it to, to the best capacity that I can. Awesome. Thanks, Mercedes. Okay, let's go to um, Eugene. Hello. Hey, how are you? Doing well, I really appreciate um, your work and a lot of um, what you shared today. And I was curious. Um, so my initial question was your reflections on the spike in gun sales. I think it's unfortunate that the spike before this was, was uh, Sandy Hook. Um, and right now there's been another noted spike in gun sales, uh, which would translate to f uh, further gun violence in the future. But that's something that's sort of abstract in people's minds. And I, I appreciate that a lot of your work is in response to gun violence. But I was kind of curious about if you had any work uh, planned in sort of, you, you kind of mentioned it, like if, if there's a way to prevent gun sales. Um, it, it, it's kind of compelling that, you know, even a, a cheap firearm can go for three to $400. So but while people are in this state of fear and panic and their first, or maybe like, you know, one of their gut reactions is to make this significant purchase, um, what sort of work would you have in mind or what would you suggest for people who are in this sort of cortisol driven state of fear to make such a um, significant purchase? And is there a way to um, redirect that in something more productive? Right, so that, that's why I want to create this digital campaign, which is really like trying to uh, ask people why are they buying guns and ammo and um, to, to donate that money instead to, um, to individuals who really need it. To be honest, I don't really know how I'm going to do that. And um, I was actually thinking like recently on my social media posts, people have been like putting really aggressive comments um, like, uh, you know, if like for instance, I posted an image of that um, the installation spiral of bells, which is dedicated to Ray Lee in Memphis, and someone was like, "Oh, there's a lot more bullets where that came from. Like, don't take away our rights. We can kill whoever we want." And I was like, "Oh my god!" Um, and and actually, and Instagram doesn't care that I that I report these comments. But I was actually thinking about asking if I could interview them um, because I feel like it. I feel like that might also create like. Uh, a way for me to understand their perspective and I think that that is you know I've always believed in like reversion from within and I think that that might be give me a much better way to think about how can I um, respond to the situation um, and in my experience when trying to have these conversations with people who have different views it's better to appeal to their empathy and their emotion rather than reason um, and so that's why I'm kind of thinking, well, okay, if you donate X amount of money to this organization versus buying a pack of ammo, which is only like $20, like this is what it can do. Maybe that will make you feel more safe. Um, so I'm not totally sure. I'm to if anyone here has any ideas, I'm totally open. It's um, something I think is really important, but I do think I might start interviewing them. So that, that's, that, those are my ideas so far. Thank you. So I'm so, going to ask one more question from the chat, and it's from um, Maribel. And and for Maribel, I would definitely I'll we can I can connect you guys to talk more about some of the things that you're doing with your organization. But I think this is a really good question to end with. Um, what advice do you give artists who are wanting to create social change? Um, I I would say um, advice to artists that want to create social change. I think that. Um, I think it's a little bit complicated, to be honest. I think it's kind of like, you know, uh, social practice art or art which is um, engaged in activism can sometimes actually just be a huge pain in the ass. Um, and that's because they, you know, people think that they are helping, but really they're walking into a situation which they don't belong or they're not helping or art is really not the answer. So I think it's important to understand, like, how are you personally connected to the subject? Um, you know, as much as my work is very socially and activist involved, it's also super dedicated to materiality and um, transformation, which are pretty archaic ideas of, of art. Um, and so um, I think that it's, you know, if you, I think it's important to think about how can my work on two levels, right? Art has this capacity to do two things. Art is also about representation. So for me, like I can maybe create change if like versus instead of like a non-for-profit posting a picture which says 
we need to end gun violence and then showing an image of an AK-47, okay, that doesn't make any sense, right? That's like a complete paradox. However, if they're working with Mercedes, then like maybe they can include an image which is showing like an AK-47 being destroyed or transformed and then the image and the method of representation matches the content. Um, and that's something that I can do as an artist, right? Because I'm not a social worker, I'm not an activist, but I, I do have the capacity to create, um, to visually uh, articulate an idea. Um, so there's that. And then there's also like, can your work actually create change and actually have an impact? And I truly believe that art can, but I think that it's a really fine line and you need to understand limitations of your work and where it can go. But I also think at the end of the day, it's also about listening to the people that you work with and listening to your community. You know, a lot of the reason why I started doing bullying, bullet melting ceremonies is because I would make these peeps, pieces and people were like, I want to be part of the process because process is just as important. And I began to realize how impactful it was for those individuals. So I think sometimes being an artist is like any other career. You just have to like do it and figure out what, what is working and what isn't working and also understand your limitations, but also never limit yourself. And I love that in our participant list, there's a lot of people who have collaborated with you. So it's really, it's been a really, really wonderful hour spent with you and we're about at time. So again, thank you so much, Mercedes, for helping us pilot this program. Um, and before we all head off, I want to just pass the, the mic over to Sam Myers, um, who is from Halcyon. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Nicole, for the introduction. Thank you, Mercedes, for a very cool, very moving virtual studio visit. I am Sam Myers. I'm an Advancement Associate here at Halcyon. I want to thank you all for being here today. This is our second ever virtual program, so we really appreciate you all being a part of, of this new program that we've started. Um, Nicole spoke already about what Halcyon is. I wanted to say something um, about who Halcyon is. A lot of our fellows say that it's our community that really sets us apart from other organizations. That's partially because of our unique combination of arts and business that we foster that Mercedes so perfectly exemplifies. She, she's really focused her artistic practice through a social and entrepreneurial lens, as you all know um, by now. Um, but it's also, um, our community is also formed by all of you, all of your backgrounds, all of your experiences, everything you bring, you bring to our programming. So thank you all so much for being here. We couldn't exist without your support. We couldn't exist without our community support. We also couldn't exist without our community's financial support. Um, as Nicole said, Halcyon is a 501c3 nonprofit. We rely entirely on donations. It is a challenging time to be a nonprofit right now, um, but we are working harder than ever to support our fellows financially, personally, professionally. So if you are in the place to do so, if and only if you are in the place to do so, please consider donating to Halcyon at halcyonhouse.org slash donate. I will put the link in the Zoom chat along with my own personal contact information. Every little bit helps, $2, $5, whatever you can give of anything. Um, Thank you to those of you who have already donated today, and thank you to all of you for being here. Please, please, please stay healthy um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sam. Um, and thank you, everyone, again, for being here and to Mercedes. Um, so that wraps up our event for today. We have another virtual studio visit coming up a week from today with current Arts Lab fellow Molly Joyce, um, and she'll be joined by Robin Marquis from the Smithsonian. So definitely check out all of that and our upcoming events on Halcyon's website. If morning events are more your thing, every Wednesday we'll be hosting breakfast with Halcyon, talking about a number of issues that are important to the ventures and artists that are, are part of our community here. Um, we'll send you a link on that. Wednesday's topic is going to cover um, um, a lot of, of, of entrepreneurs who are looking at mental health. Um, so finally, we're going to close out this event. Um, I know everyone has, has a lot of other things going on. So we'll leave the conference up for a couple of minutes if you want to wrap up on chat. Um, I know we want to share some contact information. Um, but we really hope to see you next week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we hope to see you again. Bye, everyone.